Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And really, really should have thought of something much shorter to say at the beginning. Um, <laughs> I, I am still technically, uh, to quote friends, on a break. Um, but I have this opportunity to talk to my good friend, Dr. Philip Chase. Hello, Philip. Hello, AP. It is a pleasure to interrupt your break. <laughs> and a very happy new year to you. Uh, it's great to see you on the channel again. Thank you. It is an honor to be here and always a joy to talk to you, my friend. So I thought, given that it is the start of a new year, hmm. uh, where people are thinking about the passage of time and doing retrospectives on what happened in the previous year, uh, hmm. which, let's face it, 2021 wasn't, wasn't a highlight for most people. Um, I thought time in fantasy is actually an interesting thing to talk about um how the passage of time works the passing of the, the the construct of ages and epochs and and how things change and evolve over time or as we see in fantasy don't change and evolve over time which is a, a really interesting paradox from some perspectives and yet is uh, quite explainable in in other ways so i thought we'd talk about time in fantasy Sounds brilliant to me, AP. Um, so specifically, the idea is very common in fantasy of this golden age in the past and that somehow the present is a fallen time, that there was something superior, whether it be magic or technology or something of that sort about the past and the present just isn't quite up to snuff. These are, these are tougher times to be in now. And that seems to be a very common pattern in in fantasy narratives yes yeah and um you know we see that like very boldly in robert jordan's wheel of time we're talking about the age of legends where you know they had this amazing technology this amazing magic we see it in tolkien's lord of the rings yeah. um where you had you know the the uh was it the second age where they had all of the, the group was it the first age of the i always get these confused when did the elves first leave so the first age is more of all the, the creation stuff and all that. So second age, I think is, do the elves, I think the elves leaving is the end of the first age and, and then coming to uh, Middle Earth and, and all of that. And that's the, yeah. that's the beginning of the second age. Yeah. So the second age is the golden age where the, it's all yeah. of the different, and then it, it all goes a bit wrong. Um, yeah. To put it mildly, it, 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 has, it has its issues. Um, but... <laughs> You know, we see this in lots of different fantasy stories and we can see it uh, sometimes played with very, very deliberately. So uh, Mark Lawrence's uh, Broken yeah. Earth trilogy. Right. And an age of legends that has these artifacts left over that the world has been reshaped. And mm -hmm. uh, that is something that gets played with. Now, John Clute, um, who was the, the editor of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and uh, one of the co-editors of the Encyclopedia of Fantasy, had this concept of thinning, that one of the, the aspects of fantasy was there was a great and glorious past where everything was better and cooler and more powerful and amazing. Yeah. But the story is not set in that time. It's set at a much later date where the world has become more mundane or has become grayer, more drab, that magic has leached out of the world. Right. And I think there are a couple of different aspects that play into this. And the first is obviously nostalgia, the looking back to the past for the great and glorious deeds, because when we're in our moment, we are surrounded by all of the pressures, the current pressures, the things that are going wrong, the things that we don't like. And we focus on that. We, the negative tends to impact us far more than the positive. Right. But when we cast our memories back, we think of the past usually quite often in more uh, glorious terms. So thinking back to your summers as a child and, oh yes, every day was a glorious sunshiny day where you, it was wonderful and it never rained. And if you looked at the weather reports from when you were a kid, yes, it rained. Well, if you grew up in Ireland anyway, it rained pretty much all the time that the yeah. number of sunny days was actually very few. But the ones that live in your memory are the good days. So you have that perception bias, that memory bias of looking back and 
overestimating the good and right. forgetting about the bad. And we can apply the same thing on a much grander scale with narrative because the, the great Roman Empire spanning across Europe and then right. uh, Europe descends into the Dark Ages and the Roman Empire dissolves and disappears. And you go, except it didn't. That's not, not what happened. <laughs> But yeah. that's the common myth that there was a, an age of a great empire followed by a decline of that empire, then uh, an age of tyranny and an age of violence. And you go, well, the Roman Empire was pretty tyrannical and violent. There's yeah. not much of a change, but we have a perception of the heroic past, the great heroes of legend, and they grow bigger and bigger and bigger in every retelling. So that when they get directly compared to the modern day or the contemporary setting, mm -hmm. of course, no one can live up to them. Yeah. So there's a perception of the past that is filtered with nostalgia and is also filtered with the exaggeration that comes from retelling into a glorious past compared to the mundane now. Right. I do think there's a, an historical component to all this. Uh, in the case of Europe, and I think this applies in other parts of the world because there have been other parts of the world where they had a more sophisticated civilization that fell apart due to various circumstances, war, disease, famine, what have you, uh, collapse, a, a political collapse of an empire, invasion, lots of reasons. Uh, but in the case of Europe, you, you did have a, a very uh, long-lasting and, and powerful entity, the Roman Empire, that uh, ruled for quite a long time, hundreds of years, and that established a certain level of civilization. You know, you had, uh, you know, uh, bathhouses and, and, and uh, you had uh, sewers and, and aqueducts and all of that, that good stuff, right? A la Monty Pi. What have the Romans ever done for us? Yeah, apart from the aqueducts and all that. So th there was, there is that. Um, and... <laughs> You know, you had these less sophisticated. <laughs> Sorry. I was just running through that entire conversation from that yeah. film in my head. I know, I know. Uh, but anyway, you, you do have these later, you know, barbarian hordes who took over territories that had been ruled by Rome. Take the Anglo Saxons, for example. They came into uh, what had been uh, Roman occupied Britain and uh, made eventually of it England. But you have these, these wonderful poems that refer to ancient Roman ruins, which apparently the Anglo-Saxons didn't get how these were even made because they, they exhibited a, a level of technology beyond the Anglo-Saxons. And so they would describe them as the old works of giants, right? Um, so they, they mythologized these, these relics of the past, this sense that there was some greater level of sophistication that we no longer understand because it's part of myth now. And um, so looking back on that, that by the way is where the word, uh, Tolkien gets the word ent from in, in, in old English, it's ent, uh, related to the old Norse Jotun. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there is this, this rich, I think tradition in certainly Western Europe of the idea that there was this greater past and that we are in a, in a, in a lesser time now. Um, and that, that's prevalent through much of the Middle Ages, I believe. Um, so there is that, but even deeper back in time, I think there is a sense that there, there might be these, these are very distant echoes, okay? But you have, for example, in Ireland, you have your invasion myths. You have the Fomorians and the, the Tua de Danan and all of that. And these are wonderful stories of waves of invasions, of, of various immigrations that occurred. And usually there was some hostility between the older culture and the newer one, the slightly more powerful one to come along. And I think what you have here are possibly echoes of in the distant past actual ways of immigration where you had encounters between cultures and one taking over another and a sense that the older cultures recede and disappear and they become the elves and the gnomes and the giants of myth of myth uh so there's there's an element of that i think in this as well perhaps yeah and one of the the things obviously that that crops up a lot is particularly uh, and it might seem strange to a lot of north americans um but you know, coming from Europe, that you, you can be walking down the street and, it, you know, the street is a bit oddly shaped. You go, why is it so oddly shaped? And you go, oh, well, there's this, this old thing 
from 2000 or 3000 years ago that's still there that the street had to go round. or yeah, yeah. here's a um a ruin of this old tomb that became adopted and became sacred and therefore was never built on and it still lasted uh, mm -hmm. people digging in their garden and they go oh what's this oh it's it's a Viking sword, or uh, <laughs> it's, I, f I found a whole load of uh, gold coins. You know, the, the idea of history just lying around like lumps in, um, in Europe, uh, castles or uh, fortifications that are hundreds of years old, still in use, that things were built to last. And then we look at a lot of modern houses that, you know, get built and you go, that's going to last 50, 60 years. And yeah. the amount of work you have to do to keep it in tip-top condition you how come that castle got built hundreds of years ago and it's excellent why can't we build things like that anymore um market conditions and capitalism ladies and gentlemen but the pyramids these grand schemes built on the back of slaves um but th the sheer concept of it and then you know going to other cultures where you you look at Angkor Wat and and all of these amazing temples and structures and uh, places of worship or places of power. And then when something happens to that civilization and the, the, it could be plague, it could be an invasion, it could be any number of different things, the place is abandoned. The wilderness creeps back in. You have forestry growing over it, uh, jungles regrowing over it. And so then as a modern, relatively modern day person going through, you, you're walking through a forest and you suddenly see an old settlement and you go, what, where did that come from? Yeah. And because of the difference in time period, the style of the settlement, it, it could be, um, uh, and also the uh, settlement. So it could have sunk down into the ground. So you have these door, stone doorways that are leading down into the earth, like some sort of entrance to the underworld. So you can, you can see the perception of this mythic past, this right. magical past creeping in. And yeah. when that gets wrapped up in folklore, fairy tales, myths and legends, that the idea that the past was more magical and the, the mo more modern day is mundane and rational and scientific. Yeah. You can see the allure of this mystical, magical, legendary past. Um, looking even at the, the Iliad and uh -huh. uh, the Odyssey or uh, the Aeneid, where a mythological set of things occurs and the gods intervene and there are these great warriors that would dwarf any warrior today and they had amazing magical weapons and 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 it yeah. grows in scale of something that just cannot be recaptured and then when you have when you add into that personal history uh, or national history so charlemagne uh, kings mm. tracing their lineage to great leaders like Charlemagne and Charlemagne was a great leader if you were on his side uh, not so great if you weren't on his side <laughs> right yeah um, Ask the Saxons about Charlemagne yeah so the past giving um, power to the present lending it legendary authority mm. uh, this lineage being traced down so we can see the importance of the past as this ill-defined nebulous quite often nostalgic and powerful thing that what are we, we looking at in the contemporary story? It's usually something has gone wrong and the heroes are setting out to right a wrong, that they are correcting something that is a problem. And right. if the world is all glorious and if it's amazing, then you would think you would have fewer problems for the heroes to solve. <laughs> yeah. So from a narrative perspective, you can understand great and glorious past, gone horribly wrong. Heroes are trying to recapture it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Never underestimate the attraction of an apocalypse, you know. Um, <laughs> so it's a common thing for uh, some uh, apocalyptic end to civilization. And then this sort of slow rebuilding and, and trying to figure out, oh, this is the way things were done back in those legendary times. And, and you see that all the time in fantasy. You mentioned, of course, uh, Tolkien and you mentioned Wheel of Time. Brandon Sanderson does it in the Stormlight Archives. Same deal, really. I mean, it's really kind of the same thing as in Wheel of Time, 
Uh, Mark Lawrence, you mentioned, which is a post-apocalyptic uh, fantasy, also some with some really cool sci-fi mixed in there. Um, you see it in Tad Williams in uh, Sor uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. Uh, it, you have the, the literally the present built on these fascinating underground remnants of the past. And again, the idea of this this other race that that was taken over by the current human race in the, in the form of the the elves or whatever you want to call them, uh, so that's it's big in there as well. Um, and yeah, so th there's just so many wonderful examples of this uh, idea of these older civilizations being taken over, buried literally in some cases. Uh, you see it in Malazan a lot too. You see buried civilizations from prior ages in layers beneath the present, an archaeologist's perspective on that, right? And that, I mean, um, I mean, if you're in New York, if you're in London, and you actually go down all the different sub-levels that these cities are just built on previous settlements in the same place, that you actually, there's almost like an undercity below a lot of these major metropolitan areas that have existed for a long period of time. Right. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that uh, comes up, which is, when we think about the past, when we find artifacts of the past, usually the artifacts that we find are uh, burial artifacts, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone just dropped something. Or the ones that we find in the best condition are uh, high status or high value artifacts that were very well made and, and care was taken with them in the, in the burial and that that's why they've survived. Mm -hmm. So there is a bias in that Oh look, these great things must have existed at that time. Instead of thinking them, thinking of them as exceptional, because the vast majority of the evidence is not there. It it has disintegrated over time. Like when we find a, a beautiful Roman sword from uh, one of the, say one of the settlements in uh, that was in England, and you go, oh, the Romans had these great swords, and then when they're looking at it, they go, oh, well, this was actually a uh, special sword because it was you can see this inscription and it was must have been held by like a general or blah 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 hmm. um why don't we find all of the other swords well a a lot of the soldiers just kept them uh, and moved away but also b a lot of the more inferior weapons would have been broken up would have disintegrated over time right. weren't yeah. kept as cleanly uh yeah. by history so there's a bias about amazing things in the past because we find them and we forget that the vast majority of the stuff from the past we don't find because these are the exceptional items. But it ties into a brilliant thing that we find in gaming and role playing uh, mm -hmm. games, where in these worlds, uh, where you a magical longsword with plus one sharpness or a a magical quarterstaff that does these things, and these are all ancient artifacts, storied weapons powerful weapons from a leftover age and of course where do the heroes get them they usually loot them from tombs and they go in and they nick stuff from the dead and it's a heroic thing to do much like the victorian um archaeologists who went around to other countries and just stole all their artifacts um sorry no 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 they they preserved them they, they preserved them I, yeah. my apologies um they relocated <laughs> them to somewhere where they could be looked after <laughs> um, usually quite often in private collections, but, <laughs> True. but there is this, uh, wonderful thing in gaming, which is when you have tombs, when you have these dungeons, these layers, these abandoned ruins that the adventurers can pick through them to get loot, to get treasure, to get magical objects, which again, lends itself into that sort of antiquarian notion of, oh, I found a tomb. Let's go and see what they were buried with. Isn't this cool? I'm keeping it. Um, but it creates then the illusion of a much greater, more powerful past where these magical objects are now rare in the contemporary setting, but must have been around loads of, uh, you know, in the past, because every tomb we loot has these brilliant magical weapons. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, I'm sure that bias is there and that lends to the sense of diminishment in, in the present. And that often has, a, in fantasy, a, a magical 
diminishment. So as in Lord of the Rings or, or Middle Earth, where magic, the elves are literally leaving and, and their magic is going with them. And you see it in A Song of Ice and Fire with the children of the forest, you know, being that, that prior, older, not really well understood civilization where magic kind of comes from. And uh, First Law is another one by Joe Abercrombie, where magic is disappearing from the world. Um, so it's just such a pervasive thing. One of my favorite examples, something I'm reading now, I'm four books into, is the Dark Tower series, where the world has moved on, right? And he also, it's interesting, he calls these, these um, places where the barriers between the worlds are, are sort of slippery, the, he calls them thinnies. Um, so it's interesting that he would use that particular word there, thinny. Um, so, but the sense that things aren't what they used to be and things have fallen apart, in fact, in a bad way. Um, and because then, the center cannot hold. Because the center cannot hold, yeah. yeah. Uh, or actually, there, there's a really, uh, one of my favorite Yeats poems is The Stolen Child. And they, the sort of the refrain, the, uh, the, almost a chorus is, Oh, come away, O human child, to the waters in the wild, for the world's too full of weeping for you to understand. Huh, wow. Um, and... That is, again, this, this idea of the modern day, the contemporary setting, being mundane and only in the wilderness, only in the wild, only in the far away from human concerns. It, can you still find magic? Can you still find all of these mm. different things? And it refers to a past. It refers to a tradition that has died out. Um, and we see this with, again, the perception of how things used to be done in the past on a long and storied tradition mm. and uh, in Iceland they kept the saga tradition going a lot longer than in any of the other Nordic and Scandinavian countries right. uh, even though obviously the Icelandic settlement was made by those self-same people uh, from those countries from Denmark and Norway and, and, and Sweden and right. uh, you see it in Greenland as well Again, yeah. that sort of conservative insular keeping to the old way because there's less of a bleed of culture backwards and forwards across the, the cultural boundaries. Mm. And time is uh, time and the evolution of magic or the diminishment of magic are interrelated concepts. And I think we, we could actually do a separate video and we should do a separate video basically mm. on, on, on magic and on how the histories of world evolve. Right. But I thought this was a good kind of introduction to thinking about time and about the lost ages and why they are so popular and, and how they kind of get used and how we think about them. Yeah, brilliant. I, I think you hit on a very important dichotomy there too, the urban versus the rural, where the rural is usually seen as perceived as backward, but it's also as preserving these much older traditions in some ways. And this is something, you, and, and, and legends of the past and so forth, whereas the urban areas tend to move on. Another great one that we didn't mention yet was N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth uh, trilogy. Definitely a sense of cataclysm in the past and the, the current age sort of crawling out of that and reforming itself. And the rediscovery of what actually happened is central to that trilogy too, isn't it? And, and that is not something that is preserved in the main centers of learning. It is something that has to be discovered. Um, so that's another, I think, prominent theme as well. Yeah, and it, um, oh, you, that thing happened, turn around three times and spit. You know, it's, why do you do that? Oh, it's, and it gets linked to a tradition and it's a, uh, never walk underneath a ladder because it's bad luck. And you go, yeah, because the guy on the ladder can drop something on your head. It's common sense not to walk under a ladder. <laughs> oh, you broke a mirror. That's seven years bad luck. Why would that be? Well, mirrors were really, really expensive, really expensive or they yeah. used to be. Yeah. And so breaking a mirror was bad luck because it was really expensive and hard to replace. That There are so many of these things that um, are tied into historical reasons that over time, the reason for it, the rationale for it gets forgotten. And yeah. all you're left with is the practice. And the practice then takes on a mythic quality and a mystical quality. Yeah. And it's just how, how time operates, particularly in fantasy, is, is so fascinating, where you have an arrested development sometimes of the world where it never seems to evolve past a certain level of technology. Right. And of course, this, this can be very confusing for people. But if you think about it, What's the difference between human levels of technology 10,000 years ago and 8,000 years ago? Not much. That's a, that's a span of 2,000 years. 
Yeah. How much did technology evolve? Not a huge amount. What about 8,000 to 6,000 years ago? Yeah. Now, there's some evolution, but again, not a huge amount. But when we look at um, the precision with uh, how the Mayan calendar was created or the precision of some of the burial mounds and how they were aligned with various uh, astro uh, astrological phenomena, that clearly uh, humans have always been smart. They've always been intelligent. They just had different ways of doing things. Right. And we sometimes look back on, oh, look at the, um, I've been watching the, the TV show Vikings recently. And it's, oh, look at how silly they are with their doing this. And they don't know that that's there. And you go, there are certain things that knowledge is cumulative. Right. And we build on it. Yeah. Like but, the printing press, right? I mean, you made possible the spreading of knowledge in ways that had previously not been possible. And then that's a major reason why you go from uh, to the age of enlightenment, really, in many respects, because of the invention of printing much earlier. Because, you know, you can have someone comes up with a brilliant idea and they write it down and then you hire a bunch of scribes to make five copies and yeah. you can then send it to five people. Printing press, you have a brilliant idea, you write it down. Yeah. And now you can print hundreds of copies and you can ship them to learning centers all over the world. And then those people read them. That gives them a brilliant idea. They write that down and they spread that across. So you move from having to speak to someone to explain your idea, to be able to write it down. And as each sort of development in the level of communication gets more sophisticated and easier, Right. We have the dis, uh, dissemination of information at a faster and faster rate. And then when you have travel becomes easier, when you have instantaneous communication, the, the telegram was so important to the spread of information because that then led, you know, think to the telephone and then from the telephone to the internet. And now someone can come up with a, a good idea or a bad one and instantaneously share it with the rest of the world right and it has its drawbacks but the yeah. spread of information accelerates when you have travel and when you have lines of communication like that and the more that happens that's where you see the snowball effect of things evolving but yeah. there have been minor instances of ancient technologies that we just can't replicate greek fire being yeah. one of them yeah. the uh the type of concrete that the romans used no one is quite sure how they did it um there is a um a soil uh, a soil repairing um fertilization process i think from central america that yeah no one has really quite worked out how it actually worked, but it was incredibly effective. Wow. The, there are minor instances of all of these sort of lost technologies, but in comparison to any uh, ancient world, you look at, we are talking live instantaneously across a quarter of the world, and we can see each other, we can speak to each other, yeah. we can send each other files instantaneously. I um, don't need to, you know, I have a car. I can drive hundreds of miles in a single day as opposed to getting on a horse and it taking many weeks to travel the same length of time that I can do in a car in a single or, or in a couple of days. So perhaps magic has not left the world after all. Yeah, it's just <laughs> called science now. And it's really, well, science is actually a lot of fun and interesting, but magic was just so much cooler. <laughs> yeah, cooler. I do sometimes wonder if the internet is actually making us any smarter, but, <laughs> but I mean, it, it is. That's a, a um, discussion for another time, yeah. Philip. <laughs> <laughs> but we've gone from the elves to the internet. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think we, just to sort of summarize the point, the nostalgic mythic past that grows in the retelling, the, um, prevalence of special artifacts that are rare that we then find which we then think are more common in the past than they actually were and um, some minor instances of how the hell did they do that and uh, they are mysteries because you know we don't have the blueprints to how they did something the fact that we find um, precision in some of the engineering the placement of burial tombs and the placement of these 
tombs and structures that aligned with the stars on certain days or uh, mm -hmm. time periods. Yeah. But when we look at all of that, it creates this image of the past as unknowable, mythic, strange, different. And then when we compare or when we see ruins that are just not built the way that we would build things or they they did things in a different way. And sometimes because the landscape has changed, these ruins are not sitting the way that they ordinarily would have when they were new. Right. And so they they create a mystical element to them. And also the, the concepts from gaming of, I want my character to have a really cool sword. Let's go and loot it from a tomb. So the past grows more mythic because it had these cool things that the adventurers now have. And as you point out, invasion narratives where a people and say, uh, particularly in Ireland, the, the, um, a lot of the, the Viking raids and the settlement in Ireland of a lot of the Vikings. And you think they would be very distinct to say the population that was there previously uh, then the vikings in comparison to the romans the romans were uh, relatively short but we have this image of the vikings being huge and tall because a lot of the stories about the vikings were about the big mythic warriors that grow in the retelling oh, yeah. um so there i think all of these different elements come in to give us this mythic past which can be mined as something distinct and different and magical to yeah, yeah. the mundanity of contemporary life and there is this element of you know eden you know we have this it's such a prevalent part of our human psyche i think you know uh the idea that there was something better in the past that is no longer accessible to us um and it's uh perhaps just a, a part of our our psychological makeup that we would feel so, that there's always this something that we're longing for that we don't quite have. And I think that it's very conducive to fantasy um, as well. But this, this golden age, the idea of it uh, of being something elusive, something of the past, something that we can't quite recapture, perhaps it says something about us more than we even realize in the present. Well, Philip, thank you for this. I think we should meet up again and actually talk about magic and how magic changes over time and, and the arrested development of technology and magic on a world. Because I it ties into what we've just been talking about, but there are additional aspects to that I think are really interesting. But thank you very much for joining me. It has been a pleasure. Uh, this is a fascinating topic for me. One of the reasons why I love fantasy actually is because of this very topic. Uh, I, I find it very interesting. Uh, to look at the past, um, this idea of uh, what's contemplating what has vanished. In, in the old English, they called it dust showing, which is uh, the idea of contemplating dust, literally, like looking at the dust, where, where, where's everything gone? So, uh, so thank you so much, AP. I had a great time and I look forward to that next conversation. And I am very glad that we've started off the new year with a video of the two of us discussing something and you've worked in Old English at the end. So that we're starting the year as we mean to go on. Um, <laughs> I am greatly looking forward to uh, our discussions for the rest of the year. Thank you so much, Philip. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you in the next one.